Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Bloomberg Quint Virtual Roundtable on Green Business, which is going to discuss today why ESG is an imperative for India Incorporated in the new normal, which is really this post-pandemic period that we are talking about. And this is a discussion that uh, we are doing as part of our special focus on World Environment Day, which uh, falls on uh, June 5th this year. Through this virtual roundtable, we aim to initiate an insightful discussion on the entire ESG agenda. Uh, ESG, of course, stands for Environmental, Social and Governance Agenda, and why it is becoming increasingly important for organizations, especially in India. And to help us do that today, we have an eminent panel uh, with us. Uh, we have some great practitioners, as well as uh, people from the advisory uh, side of things. So to first uh, start off, ladies first, I'd like to introduce uh, Shloka Nath. Uh, Shloka heads uh, sustainability and special projects, policy and advocacy at the Tata Trust, and she's acting director of India Climate Collaborative. Welcome, uh, Shloka, and thank you for being with us. Uh, we also have Sudeep Sural. Sudeep is uh, Chief Executive Officer of Care Advisory, Research and Training, which is the advisory and research arm of uh, Care Ratings, one of India's most respected uh, rating firms. Uh, we are also privileged to have uh, Ram Vedanathan, who is again a practitioner, who is a GM and Head Environmental Sustainability at the Godrej Group, which is known for decades for doing some amazing work uh, in the environment uh, field. And finally, last but not the least, uh, we have Vishwesh Prabhakar, who is the Managing Director, Growth and Strategy, Sustainability for Accenture. Again, Vishwesh brings uh, a lot of global experience with him uh, because Accenture as a company, it's very interesting how they approach uh, sustainability. So thank you everyone uh, uh, for joining in. Uh, I look forward to great panel. I look forward to learning a lot from you all also. But first, I'd like to set the context, you know. Uh, I know ESG is defined as environmental, social, and governance, but I think the S often gets uh, interchanged into sustainability. So I'd like to quickly start uh, start by asking you, Shloka, how do you uh, see ESG? How do you define it? And then perhaps uh, followed by Sudeep and Vishwesh, I'd like to get three different uh, perspectives. Thanks, Ivor, and thank you so much for having me on the panel today. Um, I think it's a great question to actually sort of begin this whole um, discussion and debate because sustainability can mean just about anything under the broad rubric of doing well by doing good. Um, and while sustainability can actually mean different things to different companies, ESG is a very specific set of criteria, namely environmental, social and governance um, that companies can actually measure and report against. So in my opinion, sustainability is not really a standalone concept. It cuts across all the three facets of ESG. You can't report either on environmental, social, or governance factors without that sustainability lens. And in recent years, I think what's important to know is that sustainability has really become synonymous with going green or you know, reducing your carbon footprint. So when most people think about sustainability, they think about things like reducing energy consumption, tracking water usage. And these are really important goals for any organization that does want to reduce costs or improve performance as well as make a positive contribution. But I also want to just point out that that's a pretty narrow definition of sustainability. Sustainability is an umbrella term. It encompasses all of a company's efforts to reduce its impact on the world around it. So for instance, sustainability can also mean, you know, uh, creating good jobs or promoting gender equality in addition to helping the environment. Um, but companies really do struggle to get their arms around such a broad concept. And so for that reason, sustainability has never really been integrated into most organizations. Um, they struggle to measure and report on performance. But ESG, on the other hand, is much more specific. It's data-driven. It's focused on the three dimensions I mentioned. And rather than going, you know, just green or being a responsible steward, um, it has those very clear criteria. Um, and I think it's really what encompasses or allows investors, you know, the ability to determine whether a company provides more good in the world than just its profits 
you know, you have an investor on this panel and I'm sure he'll speak to this as well. Um, the environmental dim dimension, of course, is most closely related to what, what most of us think of when we think of sustainability. Um, you know, it's focused on improving environmental performance of a company. But again, I just want to point out that sustainability is also closely linked to the other two factors as well, social and governance. Okay. Thank you so much, Shloka. Uh, Sudeep, Pishwesh, uh, would you like to have anything to add to that? I think Shloka gave us a pretty comprehensive uh, take on that. Yeah, I would uh, actually agree with what Shloka said. I think sustainability is an all-encompassing objective. And if you focus uh, specifically on ESNG, uh, that in turn will lead to sustainability. So let's take each of these one by one, ESNG. So I think it all starts with uh, uh, the environmental factors. And the starting point really is that uh, today, I think one of the most difficult and complex things to understand is how organizations deal with climate change and how climate change actually manifests into financial risks. Uh, if you take the example of the recent fl uh, floods in Uttarakhand, we saw that several power plants actually got damaged, both on the public sector side as well as on the private sector side. And there are reports which say that uh, the water diversion has caused significant damage to the quality of the river downstream. Uh, so social, again, is uh, something that is uh, always uh, uh, touching us, be it climate change-induced risks in these power plants uh, or, you know, the risks which are manifesting themselves today. Uh, everything has a social implication, and this has been as you are aware, very, very costly lesson for us over the last 12 months. And, uh, but I think the governance is really the aspect which has far, far, far reaching implications. And what is important is how we are treating various stakeholders. Are we treating them uh, on the principles of fairness and equity, or are we uh, transactional about many of these relationships? And these are not only shareholder relationships, these are customer relationships, supplier relationships, uh, and the obviously the society that we live in. Uh, and I think one of the other examples that prove that governance is important is the fact that we've seen so many financial sector entities collapse, uh, many of them in the recent past. And uh, a, lot, a lot of it obviously has to do with uh, governance or, or rather the lack of governance. Uh, so ultimately, I think uh, if the goal is sustainability, the goal is sustainability of the environment and the society that we live in, uh, focusing on ESNG is going to help us uh, reach that goal. Great. So, you know, Vishwesh, I'd like to uh, uh, actually move on and ask you the next, because I think we have a great uh, we've defined it very well there but you know from your perspective uh, and again the company that you represent uh, how do you think that the pandemic has really uh, changed things and uh, why has it made getting sustainability or the entire ESG concept right an existential uh, crisis why is it important uh, from the perspective of business resiliency and how can a really a robust ESG framework really help mitigate the impact of the current pandemic uh, uh, crisis, as well as perhaps reduce risk of additional uh, future crises that may be coming? Well, thanks, Ivor. In fact, uh, let me take off from where uh, Shloka and uh, Sudip uh, kind of uh, embarked in terms of demystifying ESG. I think uh, the point which I want to really add is that uh, we are essentially at an existential tipping point. Uh, you know, I mean, I'll, I'll share some facts, you know, uh, when it comes to climate change, essentially the goal uh, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the temperature which we can afford uh, is about 1.5 to 2 degrees Celsius by the end of the century. Now, given the government and the corporate commitments we have as of today, we are essentially trending between three and a half and four percent. And, you know, this decade is extremely important for, uh, you know, governments and corporations to really deliver on one aspect of ESG, which is climate change. 
And more than that, you know, our research highlights that 70% of this climate change is contributed by corporations. And as of today, 100 companies contribute about 70% of the worldwide emissions. So very clearly, uh, you know, from a business perspective, you know, uh, you know, the traditional purpose of the business was to really serve its shareholders. But increasingly, uh, CEOs are realizing that this has to really expand beyond shareholders and move to stakeholders. And that's why the purpose of the organization itself is changing from uh, essentially you know, uh, focusing only on profits, but also on purpose, on people and planet. You know, essentially, it's becoming more broad-based and these four things are becoming intertwined. And as Shloka mentioned, you know, they have to really straddle as a thread through all the functions of the organization. Now, more in terms of pandemic, you know, again, stepping back, you know, uh, and reflecting, you know, what has been happening in the, uh, the business world over the last 40 odd years. If we start from 1980s, 1980s to 2000 was essentially, uh, you know, 20 years of globalization. You know, many of the firms were really going from local to global. You know, that was a, that was a very big wave. Now, starting from 2000 to 2020, uh, you know, essentially it was transition from analog to digital. Here at Accenture, I believe, you know, starting 2020, you know, the next couple of decades will essentially focus on a twin helix of digital and sustainability. Now, what has pandemic uh, uh, made us realize? It has realized, uh, it has made us realize essentially two very big things that focusing on long-term sustainability of any corporation is very important, right? So it's very important to look beyond profits. It's very important to look at the entire uh, resilience and the risk-taking ability of an organization and organizations which pivoted to digital proactively before the pandemic began were able to adapt to the pandemic much better than organizations which essentially had delayed that very important exercise. And the second thing is very clearly, uh, you know, the implications of the, of the pandemic, primarily the social implications are so immense. You know, one data point suggests that almost 100 million uh, people worldwide are going to move into poverty. Now, organizations uh, are essentially uh, going to recruit from the same community. And if they are not seen as, uh, uh, as entities which are recognizing this and embedding that into their business models, it will be very hard for them to attract talent, right? So the millennials and consumers really want to associate themselves with organizations which essentially focus on uh, stakeholder priorities. And hence, uh, you know, this pandemic has shown us that uh, very clearly organizations need to really plan and focus beyond the short term and really have a long term uh, focus on uh, on their ability to kind of uh, manage the ups and downs which come uh, in a business in it in, in the course of its uh, life thank you for bringing out uh, i think those great data points uh, vishwesh and for really explaining so well uh, how the pandemic really changes uh, things ram i wanted to come to you as a practitioner right uh, now you 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 you've seen uh, in India Incorporated and ESG for a while. So how do you see ESG on the ground today? Uh, like you know, uh, Vishwesh mentioned it's very important today, right? From uh, things like uh, appealing to millennials, and I'm sure Sudeep will bring in the fact about uh, the the financial aspects of the the financial risks, etc., that companies uh, uh, face when it comes to not getting ESG right. But how do you see it? Where does ESG stand in companies? when it comes to understanding and implementation in India. Thanks, uh, Ivo. Uh, it's very, actually, all the panelists so far have uh, summed up what ESG generally means. And I think the key word to take from what they've been speaking about is who are the stakeholders? And I think that's something that company has really understood that it's not just a particular community of stakeholders who are now uh, asking for uh, ESG to be a fundamental core of businesses uh, strategy going forward. Uh, what we also have to understand is that, um, you know, ESG, it's actually existed in many forms within organizations. It's just never been you know, crystallized into, uh, you know, the ESG tripod as we know it today. You know? So it's always been there in some form, because as, at, the, at the heart of it, what is ESG but de-risking? You're trying to remove risks, and that's what any business looks for, how do I remove risks? 
Now, what has really changed, I would say, is that with the growing earlier, like that, you know, some investors, some shareholders may have had some interest. So there were there was not as much external push or an external pressure on organizations to be really ESG, not just compliant. I think that's the big change. We've moved beyond just compliance to being proactive in terms of ESG strategies. It's not good enough just say I tick all the boxes. I think that's that approach is not good enough anymore. Everybody from your consumer who's more demanding and has a bigger voice uh, in terms of you know demanding for more sustainable products, uh, even to the communities in which you operate. So the idea of a social license to operate, which your communities give you uh, where you operate. So that all this is the the crescendo is growing. You know, there's a lot of uh, you know so the, since the visibility is there, and companies themselves have poised or uh, prepared themselves to be sustainable in the long term. I think that's the very interesting point Vishwesh brought up. It's about what is the frame of reference that generally people have used when evaluating business decisions or corporate strategy? I think the frame has become bigger. You know, rather than looking at the three to five year uh, horizon, people are looking at the 15, 20 year horizon, which is why you're seeing more commitments towards things like EP100, RE100, EB100, or you know, science-based targets, which look at a much bigger window. Because I think uh, looking at sustainability in the longer run is really more practical. And the big difference on the ground, I would say, compared to last decade to this, I, the main one has been that I think this is a, more of a decade of action. I think the expectations are different. I think people have gotten a little bit, uh, I would say, fatigued with the commitments to the various protocols or the various, you know, uh, you know, global commitments and things. I think people want to see action and they want to see results on the ground. I think one of the most fascinating uh, questions that was posed to a bunch of uh, sustaining professionals was by a person who said, if all of you claim you're doing such great work in sustainability, why isn't the needle being moved? So I think that's a very, very important thing. I think it's now very important to put our money where our mouth is and demonstrate, be more transparent about our sustainability. I don't, I don't think it's enough for companies to self-disclose, for example, anymore. I think there needs to be a certain minimum standard uh, of uh, tra uh, transparency and disclosure in ESG. And I, I think that's the expectation in this decade. You're going to see tremendous... Uh, dynamic uh, ecosystems change in terms of regulation as well as technology in these next uh, five to 10 years. So I think this is a make or break it time. Uh, that's a, I think that's the main thing. On the ground, there's a lot of buzz about actions and projects and you know really seeing change happen. So that'll be the big shift. Uh, I think you put it uh, very well, Ram. You know, this is uh, make or break. And uh, uh, no, keeping that in mind, Vishwesh, my next question is, uh, for you, considering that uh, ESG sustainability is so important for India, especially as India sort of takes its uh, place, uh, uh, it takes its rightful place on the on the world stage. Uh, how different is ESG on the ground in India uh, vis versus other developed economies? How do how do you see it? No, in fact, uh, you know, I would really segment this into two parts. When I look at you know the top uh, hundred companies in India they are comparable to best in class. So in terms of their ESG practices, in terms of the vision implementation on the ground and the innovations which the top 100 or maybe even the top uh, 250 companies are doing is really best in class in India. And I'll cite a couple of examples, right? And these really come from the Tata group, right? So way back in 1912, the Tata group kind of uh, introduced an eight hour workday. Then in 1920, they introduced provident fund for their workers. During those times, the term ESG was not even fashionable, right? Or had not even been coined. Uh, another example is ITC. ITC for a company of its size is possibly the only company in the world which is carbon neutral, uh, which is water positive and essentially solid based recycling positive. So I'm just sharing two examples, but you know there are numerous examples in the top uh, um, uh, companies of India, which really are best in class because they are adopting uh, uh, global practices at speed, and they're actually using the Indian talent and the frugality orientation to really um, innovate possibly much better than global companies. Uh, I think what work these companies have to do more is really in terms of advocacy, uh, in terms of the innovation they are doing, um, and, and, and kind of uh, make themselves more aware at global forums. I think the more challenge I ever I see is really in the mid-sized and the small companies. Uh, where you know the challenge is primarily on three fronts. One is really awareness itself, right? Uh, why, what is ESG? Uh, you know why is it important and why does it make sense uh, to invest uh, in ESG? I think that that's one challenge. 
The second challenge is really finance. Uh, you know, I'll just give you a very simple example. You know, I live in Gurgaon and we have a problem of air pollution. And one of the big causes of air pollution is that, you know, uh, small entrepreneurs are burning plastic or tires uh, in open areas because A, they are not aware they, they are not aware of the processes and they are not aware of the implications of burning plastic and rubber um, uh, and the damage it can cause to them and the environment. So, and the third thing is really, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, is technology. Uh, you know, technology is very important. You know, uh, small and mid-sized companies need those systems which help them capture the data and report on their data, which also are going to be part of the regulatory uh, 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 requirements for the top thousand companies uh, in the next couple of years. Uh, you know, on financing, I would really like to add, you know, uh, another very simple example, right? Uh, companies really need to invest in uh, environmental equipment, uh, you know, sewage treatment plants, and many companies avoid doing that. Uh, very clearly, you know, they don't have the capital. So if innovation and capital could be made available to these companies, I'm sure they can actually kind of up their, uh, I would say, uh, quotient on ESG benchmarks uh, when it comes to these matters. The third point is, is regarding regulations. I think the government of India over the last eight or nine years through its BRR initiative has, has been very consistently focusing on ESG. And this year, essentially, they have launched uh, an integrated ESG concept, which they are saying is going to really become uh, voluntary in 2022 and possibly mandatory from 2023 for 1,000 organizations. So I think at a regulatory uh, level, uh, the intent and the direction is right. Uh, and we need to really focus on the mid uh, and the smaller organizations much more. Uh, thanks uh, for explaining that, uh, Vishwesh, you know, uh, Ashu and, and Ram, of course, you know, in terms of where ESG actually stands and what we need to do. But, you know, Sudeep, I, I, want, to, I want to throw this back to you in a, in a different way. Now, ultimately, everybody really looks at the bottom line, right? And so how do you see the relationship between ESG and profit or ESG and the bottom line? And are companies with the strong ESG programs really outstripping performance when uh, compared to peers? And what is also perhaps the role of investors in driving the ESG agenda? Because investors are ultimately looking uh, for profit. Yeah, that's an excellent question. So I think, uh, you know, a, a lot of the ESG initiatives around the world are being driven by global investors. Uh, today, we have almost uh, $35 trillion of uh, assets under management that are ESG focused. And a uh, lot of that is being also driven by the uh, regulators and the financial policy makers. Uh, so on the investing community, I think it is very, very clear that uh, investors are saying that if companies are ESG compliant and if they are weaving their corporate strategy around ESG and sustainability, then investors get definitely get better returns. So investors are willing to put a premium on such kind of companies. Uh, even on the debt side, I think, uh, again, it's been proven that uh, companies which are focused on ESG uh, they will uh, get credit spreads which are thinner. Uh, so, you know, uh, when we look at uh, the global investment community, all of this is really targeted more towards the larger corporations. I think uh, perhaps uh, now the time has come for us to get into uh, the mid-market and the SMEs uh, which uh, have uh, not got this global capital flow. Uh, but uh, uh, even even otherwise, in terms of the global capital flows, uh, if you look at uh, the top 100 or 200 companies in India, uh, Vishwes was making a point about the uh, business uh, sustainability report. I think uh, that, again, has gone a long way in uh, bringing all these companies into the global limelight. Uh, but... Uh, uh, a, a lot, obviously, a, a lot more needs to be done on disclosures and uh, transparency and reporting. But essentially, if you look at bottom lines, there is no direct correlation uh, because uh, ESG and sustainability is not a short-term game. Uh, it is a longer-term, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, effect which happens. And uh, let me give you some examples. Uh, if 
uh, if you take the example of a manufacturing company, uh, there is obviously a potential for manufacturing companies to reduce wastage, uh, conserve water, uh, deploy lesser energy in their operations. So all that can definitely, uh, you know, bring in a kicker to the profit. But I think the uh, the, the the more sustainable kicker, so to speak, comes when uh, companies follow uh, ESG over a longer period of time, uh, focus on uh, materiality and the, uh, the 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 stuff that that can uh, they can make a material difference to uh, in terms of ESNG, measure those and then uh, course correct over a longer period of time. And here again, uh, boards have to play a very very important role because uh, unless boards have the oversight on managements uh, in order to create value for all stakeholders over a longer period of time, whether it's customers, shareholders, you know, the suppliers, society, etc., uh, we will not get into a position where ESG becomes a game changer. So I think uh, to your question about bottom lines. Uh, it is definitely the case that uh, ESG compliant companies will get themselves attracted to the global capital flows because the investors will over a period of time find that these are the companies where returns are better and more sustainable. Uh, last but not the least, I think uh, for companies that are operating in uh, sectors which have uh, you know high uh, regulatory implications, whether it's banks or parts of infrastructure like uh, roads, power plants, etc. Uh, if you have a robust governance, what you're essentially trying to do is to ensure that you don't get into regulatory spats. You are essentially trying to uh, you know, ensure that the top management bandwidth is not uh, being spent in, uh, you know, uh, in, in managing uh, legal cases, arbitration, etc. So automatically, that you know ensures that management is going to focus, uh, you know, solely on strategy, right? So some of these are the indirect benefits. Uh, no, I would I would just say to conclude that you know there are no direct benefits to the bottom line, but obviously they will accrue more over the longest period of time. Thank you, Sudeep, for providing you know such a well-rounded answer. I think you uh, pretty much touched on every aspect over there. And I'd, I'd like to really move on uh, to to another aspect. Really, you know, one of the things in India uh, uh, that's that's very necessary and is also big is uh, a CSR. Now, I wanted to really ask you, Shloka. Now, coming from the Tata Trust, and uh, maybe Ram, you can also add to this uh, question since you all at Godrej also do some great uh, CSR. Uh, do you see that you know ESG replacing CSR and should it really be uh, that way, uh, especially in in mature organizations like yours, which have both strong CSR practices mm -hmm. and strong ESG programs? Thanks, Agor. Great question again. Um, let me address your question on ESG and CSR um, as best I can. I think the way to describe it perhaps is to to explain where CSR began. Right? It really marked the starting point for businesses to take ownership of their impact on society. And in fact, without CSR, we would probably have not have had ESG at all. Um, but I think the two are very far from being interchangeable. Because while CSR really aims to make businesses accountable, ESG criteria makes those efforts measurable. Um, because CSR activities, you know, they vary massively between businesses and sectors. There's a real lack of comparable metric available. So ESG activity, on the other hand, is meant to be generally quantifiable, um, at least to a far greater degree. Um, and I think, you know, it has to be said, you know, for many businesses, CSR has never really graduated beyond being an add-on to their main purpose and overall direction. It's really been a footnote in the annual report. It's an activity that's usually allocated, you know, half a day of effort and focus once a year. And at worst, it's really become a marketing tool. You know, it's allowed organizations to say what they're doing well without having to really back up its claims or talk about those areas where they may be failing. So in my opinion, CSR is really a subset of ESG. You know, it's probably best fitted within that social category of ESG. 
um and for many years you know if the company had a well run corporate social responsibility program that was considered sufficient to claim that it is meeting those social investment requirements today most indian companies already have csr programs partly because the law mandates this but the mandate has also made it harder to discern how one company is doing better in social governance than another especially when they have both you know reasonably well managed csr programs esg policies in contrast are really criteria led uh, they require that they have to be embedded in the core business strategy as i mentioned earlier you know rather than being sidelined and so the power of esg really lies in that integration into its business and i think what's really interesting now um is how its momentum is being driven by asset managers by consumers by employees who are demanding transparent purpose led business practices that align with their own priorities and it's not just investors to whom you know esg factors are important consumers want to know that the businesses that they buy from have positive esg policies purchasing decisions are bound up in social issues meaning you know companies have to focus not only on the quality and cost of their products and services but also on establishing those sustainable socially responsible environmentally aware business practices in order to win and retain customers um so i think you know ultimately esg activity has the potential of replacing csr because it has these you know tangible measurable positive impacts and csr is merely a subset of esg um i just want to sort of give you a quick example you know from the tata trust perspective because i think it's important to bring in sort of that intersection between philanthropy and esg and i think philanthropies like the trusts play an extremely crucial role in enabling the ecosystem for corporates to adapt to esg you know philanthropic capital really has the potential to go to places where private capital still can't we've seen this in the past when you know renewable energy wasn't mainstreamed or when we were trying to create climate mitigation strategies for the country philanthropic capital has that flexibility to drive stakeholder engagement to build supply chain resiliency to test the ground for investment before private capital comes in and i think i just want to end on this point you know 2020 to 2030 is really considered the decade of action it's the most important time frame we have to make really significant changes to our systems which will decide the future of our planet the time frame is extremely short the changes we need to make are massive so there's a lot of pressure to accelerate efforts over the course of these next 10 years and it's time to think about how we can build back better um we have to invest in sort of green recovery mechanisms for this nation we have to bring sustainability to the mainstream we have to really pivot around you know which um are going to be the indian industries of the future and to start building that resilience into our population back to you i was ram anything uh, you wanted to add over there and in fact you know shloka one of the points uh, i wanted to make was Uh, i know you know csr is often just taken as a buzzword people don't really pay attention but i think one of the reasons we put together this panel and in fact all of you the companies that you represent are all companies which are known for great csr right uh, you all of course the tata trust uh, something that's uh, it's perhaps the biggest name in india godrej again another kind of things they've done is wonderful action show is is a global uh, name when it comes to these elements and of course uh, uh sudeep uh, again through his career and even what they are doing right now at his company i'm sure they have some great uh initiatives so i think so uh, i think one of the things we wanted over here was for uh great uh, people from some of these great companies so that others could learn that was uh, uh, uh the agenda so ram is there anything you'd like to add to what uh, uh, shloka said on uh, csr esg and philanthropy i think shloka actually summed up very well it is a subset And I think such there's just a few points I want to make around that same theme. Uh, I think like you mentioned about the companies that have been doing great, who have been known for CSR. I would actually wager the fact that these companies were known for doing great environmental and social work before the term CSR became popular. So pre-CSR, post-CSR, responsible companies are going to behave in a very responsible manner. <laughs> so what I would what, the essential ideas of CSR and the way it was created here was to make sure that. even companies who didn't have a strong esg focus could somehow do something to mitigate their social and environmental impact so in in many ways i think csr is sort of like the uh, initial or the seed uh, that uh, it will enable companies to become very very forward thinking in esg so i in an ideal scenario if you know say a majority of the companies 70 to 80 to 90% of the companies started behaving responsibly on the esg front you would need csr 
that's the essential point. Well, CSR is basically just, it's, it's almost like a startup to a company who did not have other uh, methods to focus on this. But I would say another aspect of it is also that, you know, the metrics that we use to describe CSR and ESG are very, very different. I think a lot of people focus, when they look at CSR, what are the metrics they look at? It's like, is the company compliant with the spend part? Like, you know, are they spending 2%? Whereas when you start looking at from the ESG lens, you start looking at impact in very different ways. What is the social ROI or what is the impact created? How many, for that kind of money spent, I mean, what is the green impact? Were you able to do a watershed project where you were able to raise the water table of the soil over there? Were you able to increase the number of crop cycles? Were you able to improve the livelihoods of the households or the communities over in that area? Were you able to uh, uh, reduce waste going to landfill, say in a waste management project in a particular community? So the metrics, of ESG are far more refined. And when a lot of people look at CSR, they look at it as more of a compliance thing. So again, you know, we, we need to start looking beyond compliance. And to be really ESG positive, I think it's to not look at, you know, sustainability on the environmental social governance front as just tick boxes to be compliant with, but as genuine levers for growth. So I keep saying, you know, sustainability is not just about surviving, it's about thriving. And I think Sudeep made this point as well. I just want to add on to that point. Companies with strong not just CSR, strong social environmental governance parameters uh, have over the last decade or two grossly been outperforming the companies that don't. So even if you, if, you know, if businesses are cynical and they don't, they don't need a reason, they need a reason for adopting strong ESG practice, it's there in the business indices itself. I don't think you need any further proof than that. Well, thank you, Ram. I think you put it uh, very, very well. And as we move into not the, the end stage of this uh, uh, discussion, into what really needs to to happen really. Uh, so the, I, I wanted to uh, come to you and ask you, you know, uh, of course, ESG is, is often led by practitioners, but do you think that ESG really needs to move beyond uh, programs and sustainability experts and should be led now by CFOs and their finance team, considering the importance that uh, CSR, uh, ESG really has on the bottom? Yeah, absolutely. I would fully agree with that. In fact, uh, if you look at, uh, you know, the... Uh, uh, task force on uh, you know climate uh, related financial disclosures that task force has clearly laid down the fact that uh, just like how financial disclosures are signed off by the cfo and the audit committee in a similar manner uh, all the disclosures uh, uh, for uh, climate related uh, uh, financial uh, impact uh, again have to be dealt with uh, that is one. Secondly, if you look at uh, the kind of uh, regulatory, uh, I would say, uh, you know, uh, uh, initiatives that have been driving ESG, I think uh, Europe actually stands out. Uh, European Central Banks are actually asking the question, uh, how much more capital is to be put aside for projects where there is, uh, uh, you know, a, 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 a climate change risk that can uh, translate into a financial risk. Uh, so all this points out to the fact that uh, at the board level, uh, the CFOs uh, and the finance directors, the audit committees uh, have to really put in place processes that make ESG uh, a part of the corporate strategy, number one. Number two, they have to ensure that they track they measure and they focus on the material ESG uh, initiatives that are, uh, you know, relevant for that company. And after having done that, they have to ensure that uh, they do a good job of transparency and of uh, good uh, disclosure levels uh, for investors to take note of. Uh, this is how they will be able to create differentiation for the company over a longer period of time. And if boards actually do that, uh, sustainability is going to uh, be the outcome. Uh, sustainability of shareholder returns, sustainability of environment, sustainability of uh, uh, social equity, uh, and a whole lot of other uh, you know, parameters. And uh, that's how they will also be able to gain because uh, they will realize that a lot of the risk perception that investors have about their company uh, is going to be taken care of. And, uh, and, and that's the way uh, you can actually get into more of the uh, global capital uh, flows uh, which are growing by the day 
uh, companies, uh, investors who who make uh, ESG investing uh, a, a very critical part of their investing deci investor decision making process. So th that's a great perspective from the company uh, side and the, and the board side, uh, Sudeep. What what they what they need to do. I'd like to take look to the other uh, side now. You know, uh, what does India? And again, when I uh, th this includes industry as a whole, uh, the government, regulators, etc. What do we need to do to move towards stronger uh, ESG practices that are, you know, that build sustainable, responsible, and resilient uh, businesses? What do regulators need to do better? And how do you bring in more transparency and standardized norms across industry? And perhaps, uh, you know, I'd like to ask uh, one Ram to maybe start out with this as a practitioner, and then Vishwesh to, you know, uh, to kind of round this up uh, from Accenture's own uh, uh, global uh, practices in uh, sustainability, etc. So, Ram, as a practitioner, perhaps if I could ask you that question. Sure. I think uh, there are a lot of things to be done. Like what Shloka mentioned, we have a lot of things to do in the next 10 years. Uh, one of which is definitely, I think Vishwesh touched upon this earlier, I think businesses need to get more active in advocacy and they need to proactively approach um, the idea of you know, influencing regulations and really pushing for forward thinking uh, regulations. Uh, the other aspect would definitely be, I don't think there is a dearth of technology or there's a dearth of innovative solutions, both at the grassroots level, as well as what the industries are using. The sharing of best practices and you know the extension of sustainability with the supply chains. I think we've mentioned a few times on this panel today that you know the top companies seem to be doing well, but it's the MSMEs who, I mean, they're not completely, there's not a firewall between them and the larger companies. Many of them are often suppliers or vendors, or you know, they're part of the value chain. So I think it's about how do we, I don't think we can, we are, we are uh, mature enough to use a stick approach, but even if we can't punish bad behavior, I think it's time to start really incentivizing good behavior in some way to, for the smaller guys to become more sustainable. I think that's very, very critical. Uh, there has to be some sort of uh, pricing mechanism for carbon, for water, uh, which is more effective in how, you know, and it takes into account some various risks. It's not just a cost plus pricing. It's not just, uh, you know, um, global uh, cess, which is put on these things. Uh, carbon at least is you know uh, somewhat priced through the cost of fossil fuels, but water is not priced effectively at all, which is why you are going to have a situation where uh, it's going to go from being almost a negligible point on the PNL of any uh, company to being priceless, where you're not going to have any of it at all. So I think um, bringing financial you know, incentives and building the costs of mitigating climate, both water, waste, energy, into the overall ecosystem is very very critical. And it needs to really penetrate deep into the uh, supply chain. It's not enough for companies to just say, within the boundaries, within our fence, within our operations, we are sustainable. So already, you know, with the commitment to think like science-based targets, which many Indian companies have done now, there is a greater focus on scope three emissions, which involves the entire uh, supply chain. And but the next question will be, yes, great, you've disclosed your emissions in your supply chain, but what are you going to do about reducing it? And how are you going to track it? So I think the entire, there's a, there, and for me, I don't look at it as a challenge. I think there's a huge opportunity for even, uh, you know, for not just consultants, for technology providers. And I think this is going to be where the jobs of the next decade are going to be created in building this ecosystem. So I think it's a, we should embrace it in India as a, you know, they get a great opportunity. We can create a lot of value through this and, uh, you know, show the world uh, a, a path to a more sustainable future in just a short period of time. Vishwesh, if I could uh, throw the same uh, question at you from your advisory uh, perspective, from the global work that Accenture has done, what would you say? What do you think India needs to do? So a couple of things, uh, I were, I think uh, uh, Ram kind of summarized. I think uh, my personal belief uh, bases my work with clients in India as well over the last two decades is really about capacity building. I think we really need a lot of capacity building in terms of creating awareness, at the board level and also at the uh, execution level in terms of understanding ESG, its positive as well as negative implications and how do you uh, drive it in an organization in a seamless manner. I think that's number one. Uh, so they uh, also articulated, you know, the role of uh, the financial institutions is very critical. You know, we have been studying this for the last uh, 10 odd years. Consistently in our global as well as India CEO studies, it came out that finance is not doing enough when it comes to driving sustainability. But I think in the last, I would say 12 to 18 months uh, globally, there has been a, a big pivot where 
where the largest financial institutions and the asset managers are publicly coming out and committing that you know ESG is very important and we really need to embed ESG uh, in our investment uh, decisions. So I think uh, that essentially needs to be made stronger and more rigorous uh, when it comes to uh, you know the Indian uh, financial institution mechanism. And finally, you know I would say. Uh, uh, really from a mid and small size uh, company's perspective, how do we simplify it uh, in terms of uh, reporting as well? Uh, so, you know, as, as Shloka uh, mentioned earlier, you know, it is, it is, it is matrices based, you know, you have to report against those matrices. I know enough and more work has been done by, uh, uh, by the industry as well as government in thinking this big challenge through and simplifying and coming up with formats so that mid and smaller companies can also kind of report easily on ESG. But, uh, you know, we really need to focus a lot on that and really come up with some kind of an innovation uh, uh, enabled by technology to, to kind of uh, make it happen. So these are the three things, uh, you know, I would, I would say are very important for from the perspective of uh, scaling it up in India. You know, we, we, we've looked at it uh, from the perspective of boards. That's, again, the... Uh, top uh, uh, approach, uh, leadership. We've looked at it from the perspective of what governments need to do, regulators need to do, et cetera. But I think one of the key uh, things in business in, in life itself is that unless you have buy-in at all levels, and I think India especially, unless you have buy-in at the uh, bottom, right, it's, it's very tough to sometimes put this into practice. Often things remain on paper and uh, great... Uh, plans and often I don't sometimes you know they just remain goals or you you, you might tick off boxes but you don't really might not achieve what you uh, set out to do so my, my last question to you all uh, as a panel is and I'd, and I'd like perhaps Sudeep to uh, start out uh, because you know he, he comes from an advisory uh, perspective but I'd like uh, Ram uh, Vishwesh and uh, uh, Shloka to really come at it uh, from what you all have really uh, done within the organizations you all are work for because you all are uh, practitioners uh, also. So how do you really build bottom-up buy-in into uh, ESG, you know? Uh, or like, you know, you know, I, I remember one action show, uh, paper that I read which talks about embedding ESG into all that action show does like, and I'm sure that's what many companies would like to do. So Sandeep, would you like to uh, start, you know, from an advisory perspective, how do you build bottom-up buy-in and perhaps others can uh, follow and talk about what, what they've actually done to make sure this happens? Yeah, I think, again, a great question. So I would look at it uh, in at three different levels. You know, at the top level is the government and the regulators. Uh, then we have the investors. And lastly, we have the large corporations, right? So it is, uh, you know, the government and regulators which uh, who will decide, you know, for example, what is going to be the format of the uh, business responsibility report, whether it's going to be mandatory or not, uh, whether uh, uh, central banks in India uh, will actually uh, incorporate ESG into uh, capital adequacy calculations, right? So that sets the tone. Uh, it sets the tone for the investors. Now, there are two kinds of investors. There are the capital market investors. So we talked about the global capital flow, but there are also the other uh, uh, investors or, or, or the lenders or the financial institutions like developmental financial institutions, the multilateral agencies and the infrastructure financing institutions, uh, they will have to incorporate ESG uh, in, a, in a big way because when they do that, uh, they actually help catalyze uh, financing uh, from the private sector, uh, which ultimately moves into the uh, mid market and the SMEs. Right. Uh, and then talking about large corporations, I think uh, Ram made this point about supply chains. I think that is the way to go for large corporations to influence the supply chains of the mid market and the SMEs, which deliver to the large corporations. So just to give you an example, if a large corporation is actually outsourcing work, uh, it makes sense for them to ask whether their supplier uh, is actually uh, is actually implemented, uh, uh, you know, fair gender policies at their workplace, you know. Uh, so they have a very, very important influential role to play. And at the end of it all, therefore, you know, the bottoms up is going to happen, buy-in is going to happen 
uh, when the SMEs, when the financing percolates down to the SMEs, the SMEs understand the importance of sustainability. The SMEs and the bid market, uh, they uh, get uh, actually, uh, you know, differentiated in terms of uh, their ESG strategies. Uh, there is still a, a long way to go on that front and hopefully someday it will happen. Shloka, what what you what what's your take on this, and how have y'all really how do y'all really build a bottom up uh, buy in into ESG? Um, you know, philanthropy really plays a very crucial here role here in doing so because um, COVID showed us how heartbreaking it is to really experience disaster in a country where we don't have those requisite social safety nets and I think from the devastation this year that we've seen we've learned that we really need to build resilient communities in order to protect our nation especially in a warming world um, at the Tata Trust specifically we've kept communities at the heart of all of our sustainability efforts we ensure that our work increases their income protects them in the case of climate events you know creates a really new and distinct distinctly Indian, I would say, you know, low carbon and ecologically cohesive model of development. So we're really spending this very decisive decade, as I mentioned earlier, investing in India's green recovery, in India's communities and India's resilience. And we have a number of programs which focus on building and supporting and scaling those adaptive and resilient models, which in turn will equip communities to face environmental challenges as well as mitigate against future impacts. I think um, one more really important point to, to sort of bring out here is that the pandemic also brought greater attention to social issues for the business community. And it really renewed that sense of importance for ESG. It's increased the scrutiny of challenges from you know, healthcare inequities to insufficient childcare systems. Um, the interconnectedness of our global society, I think, has been more evident than ever. And philanthropic giving, you know, not just from the social sector, um, but particularly from companies, um, has really explored a very global to local dynamic. There's been a focus on speed and impact. We've seen corporate donors, you know, increase unrestricted grants to local communities um, around the world. And of course, here in India, um, there's been a great amount of relinquishment, you know, uh, that of you know, the earlier needs for more control and information. And what we've seen coming out of this is really, you know, trust-based corporate giving programs that have demonstrated a really powerful business case um, for philanthropy and for ESG that I think is something that we can build on for the future. Ram, what would you like to add to that? I think uh, both Sudeep and uh, Shloka have covered it from very different lenses, but still looking at the various aspects when you look at bottom up. For us, it's also about within the organization. I think Shloka briefly touched upon the early when she's talking about the modern day employee and their expectations of being part of a company that does good or that does, you know, that is considered to be strong in terms of uh, ESG. They may not frame it in those particular terms, but I think there is a push and pull effect. There's definitely uh, you know, a greater thrust for people to want to be involved in something which they feel is good work and they want. To be a part of that, and I think as you know, the sustainability teams or the various uh, you know business uh, units, it's our responsibility to not only make it a greater part of their role, no matter which role you're playing. I think there is not a single role in any company which is does not have an ESG element to it. I think so, including it formally as part of their roles, including as part of KRAs, that's one step. The other is also communication. I think it's very very critical. I think uh, oftentimes communication around sustainability tends to be very general. Saying, you know, like for example, on World Environment Day or on Earth Hour, there'll be a bit of communication around it. But I think communicating the impact that, you know, your company, your organization and your function has in terms of, you know, on the environment and the social aspects and what the company is doing to mitigate that. Being very transparent about it to your employees is a very, very powerful tool. It shows that, you know, you are bold, at your, you know, that you're taking on large ambitious targets, but you're also very honest in reporting about them. And getting buy-in from the top. I mean, if they see, you know, the uh, right from the promoters to their business unit heads to the plant, everyone's, you know, uh, sort of filtering in sustainability in, in everything they speak. That makes a big difference. It's very easy to, you know, sum it up in one place saying walk the talk, but that's actually what works. When you see demonstrable results, when you see, you know, when you see that you're part of something much bigger than yourself, and you know that whatever you're doing contributes to a larger good, I think that makes a huge impact. And to, to amplify that impact is where communication really is important, both to the outside world and internally. I think 
one of the biggest things in where uh, indian corporates are lacking today is also in the communication communication bit of it be it to the government on best practices and ways to move forward or even among themselves sharing best practices sustainability is a, is not a competition i mean there's no you know the competitive advantage or you know disadvantage to be had by sharing your practices with your peers so i think it's uh, it's uh, greater trans almost like an open source thing uh, is what we look at for sustainability i think that really has to catch on a little bit and uh, last but not the least uh, vishwesh i look forward to hearing from you i mean you've heard uh, from all these other yeah. i mean what what about what, what are some of the best practices you've seen of building bottom up buy in and how do you all do it uh, at at, at accenture really embedding esg into all that uh, you all do no uh, i were a lot of learnings in terms of what i heard from shloka sudeep and ram and i'll actually share you know uh, our perspective so you know our new ceo julie sweet Uh, essentially has come up with the phrase that uh, sustainability is the new digital uh, and she came up with this phrase uh, you know i think about an year and a half ago and it has given new wind beneath our sails as far as uh, sustainability within accenture is concerned so essentially as you articulated we want to embed sustainability into everything we do we are essentially a services company uh, so we don't uh, want to just uh, do sustainability advisory for our clients but whatever we do uh, uh, within accenture uh, world be it consulting be it technology or outsourcing each and every one of our offering and services is going to be now embedded with sustainability just to give you an example if you are talking to our clients about a technology transformation program then we are talking to them about how taking their it infrastructure to cloud uh, will actually save carbon emissions so that's the conversation we have if you are talking to our clients about uh, you know uh, procurement transformation program and as shloka mentioned not only save on costs and choose the best suppliers but also kind of choose suppliers which are esg compliant and uh, essentially focus on supply chain emissions on making sure that the sourcing which you are doing is ethical uh, and aligned to global best practices so it's essentially becoming a fabric of anything and everything we do for our clients now within the organization you know we want to be a sustainable corporation and we want to be sustainable corporate uh, citizens you know our core skill is uh, and our core asset is people and uh, you know reflecting and introspecting on that core asset we realize that the best way we can give back to communities in which we work is through uh, skill based programs so a lot of our uh, csr investments i were essentially go towards skillings leading to employment so it's all outcome based where we actually partner uh, worldwide uh, with the civil society sector uh, to really skill uh, communities so that uh, they can actually gain uh, employment another example you know and this is the last example i'll share is really on the social side we took a call that uh, we really need to uh, uh, move the needle when it comes to diversity so we have given ourselves a target of 2025 where 50% of accenture will be men and 50% of accenture will be women and this is monitored very closely across levels well i think uh, you really rounded it up uh, really well uh, vishwesh you know ultimately esg is about every aspect there is uh, gender diversity involved there is inclusion involved it it goes really far far beyond uh, just green and uh, just the environment uh, thank you so much everybody for being here i think we really uh, looked at all the aspects of esg i myself have a much a clearer understanding of it and i'm sure the audience is watching uh, will gain a far greater understanding and i think uh, there are obviously some challenges uh, which remain financing remains a challenge to some extent mid market i think taking esg to mid market in smes is, is is a challenge there's there's lots that the government is doing regulators are doing there's lots more they need to do but i think uh, ultimately a lot of companies are seeing uh, are uh, the benefits of uh, bottom up buying and uh, really going about it thank you so much for such a enriching uh, uh, conversation thank you uh, for your time uh, shloka ram vishwesh and uh, sudeep it was a real pleasure having you with us and hopefully next year when we do a world environment day special or maybe like you know ram said maybe do it before world environment day because this is so important we'll have much more progress to report thank you so much thank you thanks a lot Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye.